Hi, this is Chuck Wesley James from Sizes, and today we're going to have an introduction to diameter security. All right, so we're going to take a look at how bad the problem is, how people are attacking, what they're doing when they're attacking, and how we can fight back. All right, so this presentation is going to make the assumption that you are already aware that an insecure network is costing you money. If you're not familiar with, that, familiar with that, please check this space. There'll be another video discussing those sort of, sort of topics. So diameter is a signaling protocol used in the LTE network. It's in the back controlling how things operate. Now, in the LTE network, you, we're using diameter. In the 3G network and the 2G network, we were, use, we were using SS7. So SS7 was not secure. It's got the same problems. SS7, when it first came out, was this closed group of just a few carriers and they had specialized connectivity between the two. Well, now it's all IP access and there's thousands of people accessing it and you can even lease access to, to the network so you can legitimately get onto this formerly closed network. Also, what we're doing with the signaling networks has grown way beyond the first designs. Um, and lastly, this is all done by professionals. Never forget, this is done for money. Okay, so SS7 was not secure, and we've actually just made it even worse with diameter. So we'll take a look at why that is. So diameter is easier to hack. It's a, easier to hack because it's a hop by hop protocol. Responses go to this requesting connection. Um, and then we have DNS and we have NAPTER problems. We'll go to those in the slide coming up. And then we have systems that do things like ignore the application IDs and other stuff like that. Plus all the same attack vectors from SS7. Well, is there any good news? Well, yeah. Most of the hacking we see is still on the SS7 network rather than diameter. Um, that's because the 4G and LTE roaming for data is really just beginning. Most of the time when you roam with your LTE phone, you're actually doing a 3G connection, not a 4G. Um, it's, other good news is the protocol itself is pretty flat. It's an easy protocol to verify. So you can verify one value against another pretty easily in a flat protocol. Also, um, diameter allows for the use of IPsec and DTLS. So those are two security point-to-point -point protocols that are really useful. It's not an end-to-end -end security, but it's really useful for knowing who is actually sending you data. Now, 5G going forward, 5G is probably going to move away from diameter in the background for controlling this stuff and move to some sort of a web services protocol. That The 5G protocols and standards aren't quite all written yet, even though we see some 5G networks being implemented, but they're probably going to move away from diameter to something more secure. So 5G may solve some of the problems. But let's look at some of these details about uh, diameter. I mentioned it's a hop-by-hop -hop protocol. What that means is there's a bunch of systems in between. In this case, I've got an, an MME that wants to talk to an HSS over there on the right-hand side. Well, each one of these boxes in the middle has to open up the message and look at it. So it's a hop by hop. So the MME sends to his diameter edge agent. He'll open it up, take a look at the destination host, destination realm probably, and that'll go to the DEA, the diameter edge agent at the IPX, and he'll again open it up and make some routine decisions. So everybody's opening up the message and has is allowed to see all the contents. That makes um, looking at it for nefarious reasons really, really easy. It also means that you can start changing the message as it goes through. That's a dangerous thing. So man in the middle attacks start becoming very easy. So this hop by hop protocol, uh, the idea to get to deal with this is to encrypt some of those AVPs. Now it's really has not been implemented fully. It's kind of experimental right now in the industry still. So I've got a diagram showing that um, from the IETF where we can have some AVPs uh, protected with, you know, from one side of the realm to another or right from the edge end to end. Okay, so the IETF is looking at this stuff and looking at doing it to fix it up. Now there are some key exchange uh, nightmares. <laughs> key exchanging for security is an important feature that we need to figure out. So who can actually pass a key to sign it to say who it is and to decrypt a message. But uh, until everyone's ready, this is really not going to happen. Right now it's going to be sort of vendor to vendor uh, dependent because we need, let's say, the NME on one side to have the same security protocols as the HSS on the other side. But I do look forward to seeing this kind of thing implemented. Another reason that diameter is not very secure. Responses in diameter are made to the connection. 
In SS7, you made your response to the global title of the uh, calling party. So you replied to, in the global title whoever it was. That left open spoofing of the calling party. However, the hammer got worse. There'll be several connections talking to you. You know, you have this IP, there's a lot of connections talking, most of these systems have many IP addresses talking to them. And in diameter, you reply your answer to the same connection that made the response. So you don't even have to take a look at the route record AVPs that are inside of it. Can't really trust them anyways. You don't have to take a look at the uh, response uh, destinations and origin hosts and whatnot, you can just send to the same connection. That makes it particularly brittle. So here again we see the same diagram. We've got hop by hop and we're just answering whoever asked without verifying. Also the LTE network in the IMS core does call for using domain name server. Now if I'm asked to break into a network, DNS is the first place I look because it's often something that's not, uh, not being uh, considered properly. It is very possible to secure your DNS. So do it. If you're going to use it, do it. Uh, I've list listed here in the gray box some ways of securing, uh, and there are companies that deal with uh, just securing. Their whole existence is just to secure DNS systems. It's a very easy way to bring down a network if it's not secure. Also, you'll find that the, um, the, the GSMA 3GPP specs call for something called an after name address pointer. For, and it allows for dynamic discovery of other realms and other diameter edge agents. Well, in more recent standards, you'll see this is being pulled back. And the use of NAPTR dynamically discovering other realms is no longer, uh, is, is really uh, contraindicated because it's a very dangerous thing to do. Think of it this way, if you were in SS7 and you were setting up an SS7 STP, well, it's fair that you should manually go and add those global titles and add those point codes to your database and to your STP, because it doesn't happen that often, and you really want to know who's doing it. So don't talk to a stranger, don't use NAPTR. There is one part of the specs, uh, topology hiding. I want to just Talk about topology hiding for a second. Topology hiding for diameter is a way of protecting the names and number of entities within your realm. So the other outside entities will not know that you have two HSSs. They won't know the proper names of them. However, this is really crappy security. Um, typically what happens is the DEA is simply mapping names back and forth. Um, so the other realm doesn't care that it has a the wrong name, it's getting mapped to the correct name in the DEA anyways. So this really is of dubious value. Um, really, if you're turning on topology hiding, please don't think you're adding security. It's really not adding any level of security that any decent hacker cannot get through. Okay, let's take a look at some, some sample attack vectors. Okay, first one is obtaining the MZ. It's almost always the first step of what you want to do. So what you do, if you're a hacker here, is you spoof and make yourself look like, in this case, an SMS GMSC. Okay? Uh, he may have leased access, he may have hacked access onto the network, he may have paid a technician at a carrier under the table. Some carriers will lease off and you can go in as a GMSC uh, or any other network element and you pay above board to have that access. Okay, so let's say this attacker is going in as that, he's going to send a simple diameter send routing information for SMS. Short, short message. That comes back to him as a spoofed entity. He gets the MZ back. That's really important. He'll also get the HSSs and some serving nodes and some other information, but that MZ is the really important piece. Now, with that MZ, we can start doing other things. So, location information is a big one. It's one of the easy ones. It's a way for an attacker to track where your subscriber is. Now your subscriber, if you're a carrier, is going to be pretty pissed off when they find out that their privacy is gone and that somebody can track where they are. This is happening. It costs very little money. You can go onto the internet and you can pay about 150 US dollars per month and have a constant track of a, a cell phone. And uh, you can track where people are going without their knowledge. Uh, you know, simple way to do that here is we've got, we obtained the MZ from the last slide. We send a user data request message. From what network, from whatever network, 
where you have, where you have access um, to the HSS and you get location information back. There are messages you can do that with, the UDR, the IDR, the SSRR. These can all send back location information. Let's take a look at subscriber denial of service. So how can I start kicking a subscriber off the network? Again, if I know the MD and I know the, uh, the DEAs, well, easy. Simply a purge UE request. So once I am in there spoofing an MME or spoofing an SGSN, which again, you can simply pay a carrier to do, I send a purge UE request and that subscriber keeps getting kicked off. And you can send that over and over and over again for the same subscriber and they will not have access. How about a network denial service? Now this one is particularly scary because remember we're starting to talk about the Internet of Things. So if I send a network reset request, then well, to do that, of course, I'm posing, posing as an HSS, so a little bit different, posing as an HSS rather than posing as an SGSN. So I'm posing as an HSS, and I send towards the MMEs a network reset request. Well, in 5G, with the Internet of Things, there may be thousands and thousands of devices connected to one MME. And you're just now requesting that they all reset. Now, if I send one of these every second, one of these network reset requests, I'm going to be bringing down all the traffic on that MME as all these thousands of devices keep trying to reattach. So this is a very easy way of doing denial of service attacks for a geographic area. I'm simply going to spoof myself to look like an HSS, I'll buy the access from one carrier, and I will send it through another carrier's network and start crashing that carrier's network. Okay, obtaining fraudulent services. Again, I'm going to spoof myself as an HSS here, but I'm simply going to send a fake insert subscriber data request to the SGSN. And remember those previous messages, look at the detail, you are getting SGS addresses out of them. So if I send this, I can start giving myself more services. Maybe I've got a, uh, a cell phone where I'm not allowed to make premium rate calls. Well, now I can just insert, insert myself some more services. Okay, this one's a bit more tricky. This one we're going to show about how to take over SMS messages. Okay, it's very similar stuff to take over voice. We'll just look at SMS. So we have an attacker. First of all, he's going to spoof himself to make himself look like a visited SMSC. Okay, we can send some diameter send routing information messages to get uh, the or using the MSISDN of the, of the normal phone number of the carrier of the subscriber. We'll get back his MZ. Then if I spoof myself as an MME. I can send an update location to the HSS, saying, hey, I'm over here. Great, that comes back. Now, when someone else is going to send a message, an SMS message to this phone, the, the home SMSC is going to query the HSS to find out where he is. Well, of course, the home HSS thinks he is on my spoofed MME, and it's going to send the SSR. The SRR. Um, and I can send then, I can then spoof myself as the SMSC and send an SRA. To go back to the SMSC. So the whole side of it, and I can get the SMS messages that that subscriber was supposed to have. I can redirect them to myself. In a very similar scenario, with a couple more, I can actually send them to the subscriber anyway, so he won't realize that he has been, uh, that we've taken over his SMS messages. All right, so what can we do to fight back? Well, the industry has got a whole bunch of things. The GSMA, um, particularly with the fraud and security subgroups, uh, there's a bunch of documents to take a look at. So SS7 side, FS11, diameter, FS19, those are super important documents. Um, but in any case, you're, with all these documents, they, they will recommend certain things. But it is still going to be up to you as a carrier to look for different things. So you do want to take a look at the data you've got. Where are messages going in your network? What's the actual traffic flows? Do some analytics. Now let me start thinking like an accountant. Why is that message going there? And that, do I really have a service? So this is knowing your traffic flows. And ideally, if you can compare these with finances, even better. Because usually there's money related in this. So if somebody loses money, it'll be very obvious. But you may also find that you are paying money to another carrier for traffic that you're really not carrying. So take a look at that kind of stuff. Then you want to act. You need some sort of way of stopping this stuff, probably with a signaling firewall. I'll take a look at those in the next diagram. First of all, 
before we even get to a single firewall, you've probably got an SDP for SS7 and a diameter edge agent in your network. And if you've got them and you don't have anything else, you really should use them. So these are the, the diameter edge agent and the SDPs, they're really designed to root messages really fast and with great performance. Uh, the edge agent probably does topology hiding, but as you know from a previous slide, I'm not really thrilled by that as a security product. And overall, the SDPs and DEAs are not fully designed to be a security product because what we really want is we want one place for all the rules, ideally all the rules for all the protocols, SS7, diameter, SMPP, uh, and GTP. So one place for all the rules, and we also want to have one place to determine why a message got dropped. So uh, if I use an SS7 example, you could use gateway screening to drop certain messages, but then you've got a firewall to drop the complex stuff. Well, it's kind of nice to have that all in one place and see what messages are being dropped for what reasons and when and how many of them. And is there a spike in the activity? Are they coming over a certain period of time? Analytics in this are very, very busy, very, very important. So most of the SDPs and DEAs can block some messages and do some mild analysis, but you really want to have one central place for the rules and one comprehensive place to do the analysis afterwards to take a look at what's going on in your network. So things that you're going to want to take a look at when you're looking at a firewall, you want full protocol protection. SS7, diameter, GTP, SNMP, sorry, SMPP for uh, SMS messages. You want to be able to have that directly off the DEA or in front of the DEA, depending on what your network looks like. And you want to be able to do real-time queries. So if you need to query the HSS to find out where that subscriber was last registered, you want to be able to do that off your firewall. It's a bit stateful. You want to be able to take a look at how it cross or cross checking between one AVP and another AVP. You may want to modify messages when you return them. So simply dropping a message in diameter probably isn't going to do much. It's probably just going to get retried. It may be a valid thing to do in a denial of service attack, but not if you're doing if if you're trying to stop somebody who's trying to do uh, location and you want to sort of hide the fact that you've realized they're cheating and just maybe reply to them with a, an error message, send them off somewhere else. You want your signal firewall to look at the, the pre-configured GSMA rules. So on a previous slide, I mentioned the GSMA standards. Well, they all come with a whole lot of different rules that you should follow. They, they specify this category one, two, and three based on whether the message should come into your network or should not go out of your network and this kind of thing. So there's pre-configured rules you want to have set up in your firewall, and you'll also want to be able to expand that and grow it for your own circumstance and your own local needs and your own regulatory needs because governments are starting to reg regulate this. And then lastly, you really, really must consider how to analyze what messages are coming through your network, what you're allowing through and why, and what you're stopping and why. And make sure that you can sort of check on things and make sure everything's okay. Um, and you know, um, you know, when you're doing your analytics, you may find you have an awful lot of traffic coming from one country. And then you look at your financial stuff and you'll find out that that country and you don't really talk financially much, so why are you getting traffic from it? So this analytic type stuff will help you track down problems. All right, that's been a short introduction to some of the problems with diameter signaling and the security related to it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. There'll be more videos at the same spot, so feel free to contact us with comments. I look forward to those, and until next time, thank you.